it's a great pleasure and uh, an honor to have uh, Eva Yablonka uh, today. Um, uh, Eva is a professor emeritus at the Kahn Institute uh, for the History and Philosophy of Science and Ideas in uh, Tel Aviv. Uh, you probably all know that uh, this institute is one of the best possible places in the world if you want to think about you know, the biological world, uh, uh, learning, neuroscience, immunology, whatever, a uh, really great center. I've never been there, but, uh, but I, I know for sure that it's a wonderful place to uh, do research. And, uh, and, and, and Eva is there, and she has uh, written very important work on uh, different questions, including about all the ways in which inheritance can go through different routes than the traditional route of uh, uh, the genetic inheritance. And this uh, was very clear in her uh, book in 1995 called Epigenetic Inheritance and Evolution. The subtitle was the Lamarckian di dimension, and this was commented a lot by many biologists and also many philosophers of biology. And one of the things that strikes me or strike me is that Eva has been discussed by the two communities very uh, intensively. And that is something which is, uh, uh, again, very uh, impressive. She is also the, uh, the co-author, uh, uh, so again, with uh, Marion Lamb of, uh, in this case, evolution in four dimensions. Uh, genetic, epigenetic, behavioral, and symbolic variation in the history of life. Um, also, um, with Simona, who is with us uh, today, uh, the evolution of the sensitive soul. Um, and uh, with Marion Nam, uh, again, inheritance systems and the extended evolutionary synthesis. I think this is pretty recent. I think this is in the uh, Cambridge Element uh, series. Yeah. And all these books are just, there is also another book, uh, uh, Animal Traditions, which is also very good. So many books, many papers, and we are very, very happy that Eva, you accepted to give this talk today. The talk is, uh, uh, the title of the, the talk is Neural Transitions in Learning and Cognition. I'm not going to say more about Eva, uh, uh, who is a, 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 a you know, a wonderful thinker. I really look forward to uh, hearing what you have to say today, Eva. Thank you again for accepting our uh, Feeding Biomed invitation today. Thank you very much, Tuma. I will, uh, I, I think uh, I, this work was done with uh, Simona, Simona Ginsburg, who is here, and uh, Anna Zhelikovsky pictures uh, adorn the book. Here we have many of them in color. And uh, I hope that, and what I'm going to talk about is something that goes a little bit beyond the book that Simona and I wrote. It's something that we developed uh, after we published the book uh, because uh, we were thinking, uh, because our book is uh, centered on, uh, on the question of the origins of uh, subjective uh, experiencing consciousness. Whereas the kind of, the, what I'm going to talk to you about is about cognition and learning more generally. Con consciousness requires a certain type of cognition and a certain type of learning, but cognition and learning go beyond this. So I'm, what, we are, what, what I will try to do in this lecture is the following. I will, I, I will use a marker for cognition. Cognition is defined in many ways as we shall see. And uh, they are the, the, and one of the ways in which it is defined is by characterizing it rather than defining it by some kind of toolkit, uh, a toolkit of capacities. Now, all these capacities are slightly overlapping, but if you want to study each and, and every one of them, you have a huge amount of work. On the other hand, if you can find a single capacity that sort of entails all these capacities, then you can, do, you can do a comparative work much better and you can also understand the relationship between the different capacities, how they form a dynamic system. So we have suggested that learning is a very good proxy or marker of uh, cognition. And uh, I will go, and this will be the first part of the lecture will be devoted to this. So what I will do is I will present you with characterizations of cognition and of learning. I will uh, explain why learning is a good proxy for cognition. 
Then I will talk about transitions because I'm going to talk about transitions in learning and cognition. So why transitions? Why can't we just study evolution without transitions? And what do transition give us? And what kinds of transitions are there? Because it's not just one type of transition that one can think about. Then I will talk about a certain type of transition, informational transition in, in neural learning. I'm going to talk not about learning in general, but about neural learning. I will focus on two transitions. I don't know if, if I will have time for both of them. So if I don't, I will just stop after the first one. The first one that I will talk about, it's not the first one, but the first one that I will talk about is the transition to associative learn learning neural animals with brains. The second one will be the transition to animals that can learn through something we call unlimited associative learning. It's a type of learning that is very, very open-ended and uh, fairly, but not very complex. And we think that it entails consciousness, also a transition to consciousness. And then I will end with some conclusions. So what is cognition? Uh, there are many, many definitions. There is a definition that defines cognition in terms of uh, that, uh, that, uh, that defines, uh, that defines cognition, not in terms of consciousness, but in within the framework of consciousness. For example, they do things that it is the ability to form, to form mental representations that can guide behavior. This is one end of the spectrum. On the other end of the spectrum, we have Maturana and Varela, who suggested that any autopoietic system is a cognitive system. Any living system is a cognitive system. It's it's a, there are different ways simply of talking about, about life. Life is a cognitive, is, is defined in a, in a sense by, is, is entails cognition. There are other uh, character uh, definitions or characterizations that tend to the autopoetic end of the spectrum, but give us a little bit more detail about what, what, what exactly people mean. So for example, Shuttleworth in 1998 defined cognition as the mechanisms by which animals acquire, process, store, and store information from the environment. And these mechanisms include perception, learning, memory, and decision-making. Uh, Pamela Lyon in 2005 uh, suggested that cognition is characterized by a toolkit of capacities. For example, signal trans, uh, transduction, balance, communication, sensory motor coordination, memory, learning, anticipation, decision-making in complex and changing circumstances. Balushka and Levin for, uh, were talking about cognition is a total set of mechanism and processes of information acquisition, storage and process, processing and use, any level of organization. So it can start with a single cell and it can also go into uh, to, to complex biological org uh, organization and can also include artifacts. A memory, is a, an essential component of these processes at all levels, according to them. And, a recent, and recently, though, there is very recently, there, there, there was a, a, a two issues were published in Philosophical Transaction of the Royal Society and the paper that, and the lecture that I'm giving is based on a paper we had there. And this, uh, and, and these two issues contain paper, papers about uh, what, what they call basal cognition. This is very, the, the kind of cognition that characterizes very simple, or, very simple organism at, at the base of the phylogenetic tree. And, uh, and uh, it includes single celled organisms, plants, uh, 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 and, and very, very simple animals. And according to uh, this recent, uh, a recent definition that uh, Pamela Lyon and her colleagues suggest there, uh, basal cognition includes fundamental processes and mechanisms that enable organism to track some environmental states and act appropriately to ensure survival, finding food, avoiding danger, and reproduction. And she suggests a kind of uh, expanded toolkit an expansion of the toolkit she presented uh, before. I will not go into it. I will just give it, uh, show you the slide in order for you to get a kind of general impression, of the kind of thing that you need in order to be uh, um, uh, a cognitive system, a cognitive 
according to this approach. So you need to have orienting the press, sensing, perception, discrimination, memory, violence, decision-making. You have to behave in such, some way to respond. You have to solve problems, to detect errors. We have something like uh, that is similar to motivation, anticipation, and learning. Now, the reason that I put learning here in big, uh, uh, in big letters is not co a coincidence, of course, because as I will argue very soon, all these other things that are in this list are, are actually entailed by learning. If you have learning, you have most of them, if not all of them. So if we sort of agree that if we found an organism, let's say we're going now to Mars and we're going to find some kind, maybe we'll find remains of organisms, we shall say, well, this organism could had all this list of capacities. And we'll say, well, if so, if they really did have all this list of capacities somehow, and we can really infer them, then they were cognitive systems. We would agree that this is that this big toolkit is a, a some kind of characterization. But it's very difficult. To, so, you, what will you do exactly if you want to study cognition? Will you study each and every capacity on its own? How much of this capacity do you need for the system to be a cognitive system? Do you need a lot of this capacity? Just the very, very, very basics of this capacity. What exactly are you comparing when you're comparing uh, this toolkit? It's, you can do it. You can study each capacity uh, in its own right, but it's, it's a quite a difficult uh, task and a demanding task, which as biologists, we should uh, accept. But nevertheless, we, we are also trying to look for something that will make life easier in, term, in terms of comparison, in terms of uh, uh, the actual work that we're doing. So if we can, can find good proxy or a marker of cognition, that would be useful. So Simona and I suggested that there is a unifying theme for all the major steps in the evolution, because we were uh, focusing on the nervous system, uh, on the evolution of, uh, uh, evolution of cognition from annual to neural organisms and from nerve nets to centralized nervous system. And uh, this uh, theme and all the, and we, we suggested that the transitions in cognition, the kind of deep qualitative patterns of change that we see in the living in the, in, in the evolution of cognition, they uh, entail key transitions in memory and in learning. Now, according to the classical definitions of learning, it requires three major processes, a process of encoding, a process of uh, some, some kind of something, some, uh, so there is some input from the environment, which is, changes the, the internal state of, uh, uh, of the organism, and it is it's said to be encoded within the organism and stored within the organism, so that it is somehow this change, change in, in organization persists for, for, for a while, even when the original signal is, not, is no longer present. And there is also recall. So that when uh, the, the signal re reoccurs or part of the signal reoccurs, the organism can respond again in and uh, by, by, uh, can respond to it more rapidly or less rapidly, uh, depending on the kind of, uh, 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 depending on exactly what kind of change uh, the, the, the storage entailed. But, what, what, uh, but in all cases, there will be a, a change in the threshold of response. So encoding storage and recall are something that is part of almost all definitions of learning. And of course, the sophisticated def definition uh, discussions of learning also show us very intricate relationship between the processes of encoding, storage, and recall, which are not completely independent of each other. I will not go into that, but it is very important if you really want to go into the details of what is going on in each and every system. Now, if we're thinking about uh, learning, learning obviously 
entails many, many of the, uh, of, of the capacities that are in the list that so many people agree is a list that characterizes a cognitive system. So learning involves sensor effect by a coupling. There must be some kind of attribution of balance, some kind of intrinsic reinforcement, and there must and the uh, 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 recall uh, uh, requires a change. In, requires a change in the uh, response threshold. The system can be said to anticipate the effects of the uh, of stimuli. It enables uh, complex behavior and something that we, and decision making within the lifetime of the organism. It can lead to changes in uh, the uh, in the response threshold due to the six signals coming from another biological entity. So we have something like communication, and so on. We can show that almost all the uh, uh, that a, a whole group of a, a whole cluster of capacities that I described by the people who are thinking about cognition is actually realized within a learning system. So we're not defining learning as cognition, but we're saying that a learning system is definitely a, a, a cognitive system, even a very, very simple learning system. Now, why is it good to, 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 to think about cognition, in to, uh, about learning as a proxy for cognition. Because learning is a simple system capacity. And it, and it is fairly clearly defined. And it also points to functional and temporal links about the sensory changes, storage, and behavior. So if we are looking at this list of capacities that, that people are, are sort of putting forward, and we think about them within a system of learning, we can see not only that there, that there is just a kind of a shopping list of capacities, but we can actually see how they are related to each other, in, uh, how, how, how they're functionally related to each other and temporally related to each other. So they form, a co so we can actually see the architecture of the co of a cognitive system. And if we, if, and if we're thinking in, in terms of cognitive system with an architecture, we can start comparing different uh, cognitive systems. So, and the other thing is that learning, because it is, uh, it, it is well-defined and uh, conceptually and methodologically, and uh, there's a lot of work on learning theory. So this helps us we can use the tools that we already have in order to study, uh, to, uh, to study cognition. And it allows, and this allows us, of course, to compare cognitive, uh, to, to compare different uh, learning system, cognitive systems, in different, in different, very, very, very different organisms. And it makes the study of both the continuities and discontinuities in the evolution of cognition much easier. So we wanted, to, we want to study. Uh, we, we are thinking, when we're thinking about evolution, we're particularly interested in evolutionary transition because what we want to understand are the broad kind of patterns of life. And when we look at life and when we look at cognition, we see, we can, we have intuitive uh, feeling that there are different types and levels of, uh, of cognition and of complexity. And we would like to somehow uh, understand them in order to see what has what what qualitative changes have occurred and also how these qualitative changes have occurred, what are the continuities and what what are the discontinuities? Now, when we think about cognition uh, about transitions, we also have to do some conceptual work, or uh, and some and make some decisions as to which kind of transition we want to discuss. So we have the uh, this is not a nuts picture, by the way. So we have evolutionary transition and, uh, and uh, ecological transition, which we know very well. For example, the transition from aquatic life to terrestrial life. Uh, and uh, this, kind of, uh, this kind of ecological transition involved new integrated uh, uh, suites of, uh, of physiological and morphological adaptations. And then we have something that we, we call following uh, Daniel Dennett, transitions in intentionality. 
And these are transitions that involve additions to the type of hierarchically nested variation that are selected. So we can have selection among genes, among genes and behaviors, among gene behaviors and virtual non-symbolic representations, and among genes, behaviors, virtual representation and symbolic cultural representation. So we can have, uh, we, we can have what uh, Dennett calls the very simplest, uh, the simplest organism when all you have is a classical Darwinian selection, Darwinian organisms. Then he talks about the organism that have, in addition to that, also that can learn by reinforcement and therefore, the, therefore there is behavioral selection. He calls them Skinnerian organisms. Then he talks about those who can imagine and can choose between imagined actions and he calls them Popperian organisms. And he calls the, the, the organisms that can, uh, that can select among symbolic representations future-oriented representations that are, uh, that are represented by symbols uh, by, uh, as Gregorian organisms. So this is another way of sort of carving the, the complexity in the living world and talking about transition between this kind of intentional systems. And you have the Aristotelian, what we call the teleological transitions. We were inspired by Aristotle. And we recognize three main uh, teleological transition from non-living to living systems, from non-sentient organisms to sentient ones, and from non-reflective animals to reflective ones. So from non-living to living, the, you have now a with living organism, you have a, a new system with goals. So the goals are of course uh, survival and reproduction. It's a kind of teleonomy arises from non-sentient organism to sentient one, there are actually intentions and goals, felt goals, there are feelings, desires, passions that drive action. And there are also reflective rationals ones in us, symbolic uh, creatures like us, we're driven by ideas, by goals, by, by, by the beautiful, by the just, by, by the good, things like that. So these are different types of uh, teleoi that characterize this system. And then there are uh, the most well-known transition, the informational transitions that uh, Miner Smith and Satmary have uh, discussed, which involve changes in the acquisition and coding storage and transmission of information that lead to higher level entities with greater division of labor and to new levels of hierarchical control. This kind of changes include either increase in nested hierarchy of the system, such as transition from single cells to multicellular organism made up of many cells, or the addition of a new way of storing and using information. For example, the transition from RNA as hereditary material and enzyme to DNA as hereditary material, and proteins as enzymes. Both types of uh, transition within the information transition system, the nested and the non-nested, entail the addition of a new and higher level of information integration and ad an, addition, an additional global top-down control. Now, when Minot Smith and Satmari discussed this transition, they talked, they were interested and talked only about transition in genetic, in, in systems with uh, uh, in, uh, with genetic information. And therefore they completely missed the transition to neural organisms, which was not one of their major transition, nor was the transition to consciousness one of their major transition. Now, I'm not, <laughs> it, 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 but when, if you're thinking, it, even in their terms, you're thinking about the information transmission and the acquisition and coding storage and transmission of information that depends on neural uh, uh, processes, you can also uh, you can also identify uh, certain transitions, and uh, we were uh, so we took the framework of Minot, Smith, and Satmari as the main framework of our uh, uh, as as a leading framework, but we also, as you will see, incorporated the others, or they were, became incorporated because they are related. So. So what we are interested is informational transitions in, neur in neural cognition that depend on neural mechanisms and involve 
a new mechanism that, in, that integrate neural information, that can evaluate and store it, that can, and that can coordinate the actions of the organism. And we, uh, and we recognize or identified five major neural transitions. And the first two occur in very simple basal organisms. And the five transitions that we, uh, we, that we identified are, the first one is from non-neural to neural organisms. If you're talking about neural organisms, well, you have to talk about that. And these are organis uh, neural organisms, and this organism learn by neural, habi by neural habituation and sensitization. Sensi habituation and sensitizations are very, very simple uh, modulations of reflexes and of uh, exploratory uh, behaviors. Now, I will not discuss this transition in detail because this transition really requires a whole lecture. It's really very difficult to do justice to it. It will become completely incomprehensible if I start talking about it in try to condense it within uh, 20 minutes or so. But what is important is that the scope of learning by habituation and sensitization in neural animal has vastly increased. Habituation and sensitization is something that can be learned by non-neural organisms. Uh, some paramecia learn by uh, ha uh, habituation and, uh, and uh, there are, uh, and people say that also, th there are some records of uh, learning of, by habituation, although everything there is contested in plants and sensitization in plants. There are even, uh, uh, there are other uh, claims as well, but we'll not go into them at the moment. But certainly the scope of uh, learning by habituation and sensitization is enormously increased in, uh, in neural organisms. Then there is second transition that we recognize, and this is the transition to animals with the central nervous system a flexible, although in some ways limited, associated learning. The third transition that, and I'm going to, to talk a little bit about that one. The other one that I'm going to talk a little bit about if I will have time, but I will not talk about it if I don't, is the transition to animals with open-ended, unlimited associative learning with hierarchically organized brains that enable mental representations. And the other transition is the transition to imaginative animals. And the last transition is the transition to symbolize and culturally learning and uh, humans. And in each of this, we argue, there is this additional level of control, in, in this case, in the, in the nervous system. So I'm going to focus on the, uh, at the moment on the transition of the transition I'm going to talk about, the transition to neural centralization and to limited associative learning. Now, what is associative learning? I think you all know what it is. It refers to learning that involves the formation of a conditional pairing between a neutral, non-reinforcing non stimulus or action and the subsequent reinforcing stimulus or action. And therefore, uh, I, and learning by habituation and sensitization is uh, known in the psychological literature as non-associative learning. I'm, I'm defining it here because it's very, very confusing when we're reading the computational literature. Because for the computational people, associative learning is, is uh, Hebbian, is anything that is Hebbian-like learning. Neur uh, neurons that uh, fire together, wire together. It is not conditional in, in the sense that it is used by the psychologists. So it took us a long time to figure it out that they're actually talking about different things. We are talking in the way that the psychologists, the behaviorists and post behaviorists are talking about associated learning and the pre-behaviorists too, by the way. So we know about this example, two, here are classical examples of uh, associative learning, conditional, uh, conditional associative learning, classical conditioning, Pavlovian conditioning and operant conditioning. So in, the, in, in one case, the sound of the bell predicts food and, that, and therefore leads to uh, uh, salivation. In the other case, uh, a rat, uh, a poor little rat sitting in a very diminished uh, environment, very poor 
environment uh, learns that if, if it pushes a lever, it will get food. And she didn't know anything about it by mistake. She accidentally pushed this lever and got the food. And, and, and after several trials, she learned that this, this, this is the way of getting food. And these are just examples. And this is a very simple example because we have a very, very simple stimulus, the sound of a bell, a very simple stimulus, one push on a lever, and then there is some kind of intrinsic or extrinsic reinforcement. Now, what both of these types of conditioning entail is that there is a sensing of a stimulus or several stimuli, in this case, it's very simple stimulus that initiate a process uh, within the animal uh, that uh, change the internal state of the animal. And, uh, and it can, it, uh, in, in the case of uh, Pavlovian conditioning, it is uh, a stimulus that comes from the, from the world. In the case of the uh, of Skinnerian kind of conditioning, operant conditioning, it's the result of the action of the animal. Then there is some kind of behavior, that behavior is all involved in both cases. Reinforcement is in, involved, either intrinsic or extrinsic, and the extent to which the animal anticipates a reinforcement determines uh, the extent of learning. The more surprising and unexpected the reinforcement, the more learning, the more learning occurs. If you are anticipating something completely, of course you don't have to learn anything. And you learn only very little if you already have learned almost, uh, uh, you, you, you only need to learn tiny little bit to be perfect. But in the beginning, learning uh, after you sort of uh, begin to figure out that there is some kind of, that uh, there is some kind of correlation, then learning goes fast, much, much faster in the beginning of the process. Now, we call this limited associative learning because we were looking at first at very simple stimuli because we realized that in many, many simple animals, for example, in C. elegans, in planarias, in, uh, in, in, uh, in the Aplesia, in the, uh, the sea hare, uh, learning is very, it depends on very simple stimuli. And, uh, but nevertheless, even this, uh, so what you're doing really is spontaneous and stochastic exploratory activity and pre-existing simple reflex relation are combined very flexibly in these animals. And, um, and even uh, other very simple uh, stimuli such as a flash of light or a buzz or a vibration or push or simple actions like pushing a button, which are unrelated to any particular reward and punishment can become associated with them. And this is a huge thing because even this very simple kind of association that are formed inform the, uh, the organism about relations, stable relation in its environment. It can respond to them. It can respond to something that predicts a condition. But what the, there are many things that these simple animals cannot do. They cannot discriminate between differently organized, multimodal compound stimuli or between complex eye action patterns. They can only learn if there is a temporal overlap between the neutral stimulus and the reinforcing stimulus or action. And there is very, very uh, limited ability for cumulative learning. There is also very limited ability, if at all, for, for uh, the doing motivational trade-offs among learned actions and reflexive action. So if you learn that something is good, it's very difficult to, re to unlearn it and to learn that this is bad for these animals. Nevertheless, they can do a lot. And when we tried to see, to look at the taxonomic distribution of these animals, we found, we discovered to, much to our surprise, in fact, that all the animals in which conditioning has been conclusively shown have a brain. We were really surprised to find that. But not all uh, animals with brain uh, have, uh, can learn by this kind of uh, uh, conditional associative learning. So I want just to show you 
they they worked on many many animals, and all the animals that are uh, indicated by a circle, whether filled or not filled, whether with rays or without rays, are the animals that have brains. Not all animals have uh, have a, have a central nervous system, a brain. Those that have a, uh, that uh, that have a gray uh, circle have a uh, have a associative learning, are showing associative learning. And those that have the rays, like little suns, well, they show a particularly sophisticated uh, associative learning, what we call unlimited associative learning, to which I come, will come uh, shortly. So those animals that have uh, limited associative learning, they're more widespread in the animal kingdom. They have a flexible ability to learn simple associations, not very, they cannot make complex, as I said, cannot make the complex discrimination. They cannot, uh, cannot learn when there is a, a, a time a gap. They cannot flex, flexibly uh, change their, uh, make uh, um, uh, motivational trade-offs, but they can do a hell of a lot. So it really, uh, uh, and what we saw, and this is something that uh, is characteristic of animals with brains, and they are bilateral animals. They have a head, and uh, this head has a lot of sense organs, and there is a differentiation within the brain of these animals between sensory and motor uh, areas, between the regions that control sensory inputs and motor inputs. And, uh, is, and, it, and there are also areas that coordinate the uh, relationship between sensory and motor inputs in these in this animals. And some of them are very simple animals. Uh, we, now, when we try to think evolutionarily about this and we try to see when this appeared, so here we are again, uh, in this picture, when we're looking at when this kind of uh, creatures appeared, well, they seem to have appeared a very long time ago, and uh, probably at the, uh, during uh, the, the groups in which uh, this uh, type of learning exists during the Cumbrian. And we suggested some evolutionary scenarios, which I will not go into in order to explain, uh, because I don't have time, in order to explain uh, the evolution of uh, this kind of systems. We think that uh, we know that during uh, the, in the, the, in the Adiacaran, just before the Cumbrian explosion, the, uh, the Cumbrian era, uh, there was an increase in, uh, in oxygen that allowed uh, animals to have larger body size. And this was probably very important because if you have a larger body size, it takes you lo longer to develop. You have a, large, a longer lifespan. You, you need a larger brain in order to coordinate a larger body. This puts a lot of uh, constraints and, uh, and leads to a lot of new affordances by, uh, by uh, this, this, the existence of this controlling, central controlling element. So, so here they are again, and we, and and what what happened when you have since associative learning and the ability to predict a, a correlation that that something predicts something else, something predicts danger without actually facing the danger, responding to the danger, or responding to an up to a, a future appetitive stimulus by approaching it and so on. This is a, a, a very, very important uh, adaptation, which happens during the lifetime of, of the organism, during ontogeny. And it allows animals to exploit and construct new niches and promote new types of interactions and arm races. And it leads to adaptive responses that can become fixed through processes such as genetic accommodation. And we believe that this kind of uh, that this kind of uh, evolution of learning drove the evolution of sense organs and of more complex motility, the ability to move. So that, and we, we believe, so the transition to LAL was both informational in the sense that it required a brain that will, uh, 
coordinate that, that and the brain that is to some that that has parts and parts that control other parts so there is a an, another level of hierarchy for controlling the organization of uh, the neural organization of the animal it is intentional in the sense that the behavior is behaviors are selected not just genes and it is ecological because if uh, because we believe that it led to that it was one of the factors that led to the Cambrian explosion. Now, LAL, which already we think appeared at the, at the very beginning of the Cambrian or even before the Cambrian in the, in the later the current period was followed very rapidly, we believe in three groups, uh, in two groups, sorry, initially, uh, by a more complex form of associative learning, which we called unlimited associative learning, UAL. By unlimited, we don't mean unlimited in the mathematical uh, sense, we just mean a huge expansion of the potential for association, huge extension, which I will go into. And it gave, and it led, and it uh, sort of uh, enhanced greatly further evolutionary interactions and, uh, and, and the arm races of the Cambrian. And we believe, as I said, that uh, associative learning, both LAL, but even more so maybe UAL, has been one of the factors that drove the Cambrian explosion. And we elaborated about that elsewhere. So what is this UAL? This is the last point I want to say. I think it will be unfortunately 55 minutes, uh, the lecture. Uh, so an organism with the capacity for UAL has during its own lifetime can learn, go on learning from experience about and learn about the environment and about its own actions in practically unrestricted can distinguish about among novel complex pattern of stimuli and action. For example, it can learn how to navigate in a new terrain, to discriminate between different types of animals, between different types of roots, and so on. And the learned patterns that it learns are genuinely noble. They're not flex a reflex eliciting, no, they have been there in the past. So it learns to it learns about a complex of stimuli and, and their organization in space. It manifests second order learning. So when it learns a, a, a new complex image or a new pattern of, uh, on, or, or, or new patterns of behavior, this pattern or this behavior can become itself associated with a new compound pattern. It can learn all, also if there is a time gap between the neutral stimulus and the reinforcing stimulus or reinforcing action. So this is called trace conditioning in the behaviors literature, but so they don't have to overlap. There is a kind of escape from immediacy, if we want. And the, it, it has a flexible value system. It can learn that something that was, that was once good is not good anymore. So something that was a shelter is now, is, is now a place of danger and it can do it very flexibly. Now, if you have the ability to do this, we argue, now, this is just an example for a UAL. This little mouse learns to navigate in a complicated new terrain to find food. It has to take to, to assimilate and put together a lot of aspects of its environment and a lot of aspects of its own action in this environment. Now, why do we say that that's a very impressive thing to, to have this kind of ability? There's no doubt about it. But why is it related at all to something at a completely different level, such as consciousness? Again, this is, I, I will not go into it, but the, the kind of logic that we're using here is the same logic that we use when we, did, when we said that learning in general is a good uh, indicator or marker of cognition. What when we're looking and reverse engineering from the ability for unlimited associative learning to the kind of system that can implement this ability, then we see that all the features that tradition, that many, many different philosophers, psychologists, uh, and neurobiologists have attributed to, uh, to a conscious animal, are in place. For example, unification and differentiation, the ability to unify 
aspects uh, to, to put uh, that we, uh, when we see the apple, we see it both as round as, as, and as red. And also if it's fragment, we can also at the same time smell it and it's, it's one experience. So this is unification and we can differentiate also the things are changing all the time. This is something that you, that is necessary is needed in order to construct the compound stimulus. There's global accessibility, that there is a need to integrate information from multiple systems and to compare them, to generalize about them, or to do all kinds of, op of operations on them. There is selective attention because we have to exclude a lot of things, the environment, there are a lot, a lot of stimuli in the environment which have to be excluded all the time. There must be intentionality in the sense of mapping or representing something this compound environment this compound stimuli has to be or the compound actions have to be sort of represented in the brain in some way they have to be mapped and they have to be stored there is integration over time is needed in order for us to learn even if there is a time gap a flexible evaluation system is needed by definition of ual and the, the embodied agency is needed for the world and learning association between action and, uh, and, and the world from a stable point of view. We have to have a stable point of view from which we can compare things, it, it compare stimuli and action from the same perspective. And we have to differentiate between self and, our, and, and an animal that can do this, have to differentiate between self and other in order for it not to confuse stimuli that are self-generated from those that are well-generated. Otherwise, it will not, will not be able to act in the world at all. So all these things are necessary in order for you to have a system like UAL. And all these things, interestingly, are characteristic of consciousness. So who has it? Who has UAL? Because we, don't, we can't ask the question, who has consciousness? Because <laughs> as, you, as you know, this is a very controversial, it's a much more controversial question than the question who has UAL. So we can ask the question who has UAL, and if you sort of adopt this pro our approach, then you can say, ah, these are also the conscious animals. So here, the, so there are three groups in which consciousness was found in the vertebrates, almost all of them, in the uh, in the in, in the sorry in the in some arthropods and in the coleoid uh, uh, cephalopods, which are the squid, the cuttlefish, and the octopus. And uh, what is interesting, again, I will not go into it, is that when you're looking at the uh, neural systems that they have, they have neural systems which have to implement the capacities that of integration, of unification, of sensory unification, of control of sensory unification, and uh, and uh, of rain, uh, they have uh, memory systems. They have reinforcement. They, they have systems for reinf uh, for, reinf for regulating uh, value, and so on. Very very interesting. And one of the most interesting things is if you compare the brain of the insect to the brain of the mammal, in, in spite of the fact that they're totally differently organized, their uh, structurally, their functional organization is amazingly similar. If this is what you see on the uh, right-hand side top. Now, UAL was only the beginning, uh, it was not the end, uh, uh, consciousness uh, and consciousness were not the end of the story, but the story of, uh, of the evolution of, of cognition, the evolution of, of consciousness is, uh, went on. It went on into what we call the, after the following Dennett, the Popperian organism, the, those animals that can select among imagined alternative actions without having to try them out. And then us, and uh, we, uh, the transition to human cognition included the ability to use a new system of representation and communication, a, symb a symbolic language, which like neural communication uses a novel general purpose communication currency, which is language. So there were other very important transitions and every transitions like that can have a whole library devoted to it. And, and there are such libraries. So I want just to summarize, put it all together. 
the, the, I tried to cram a lot into this lecture, so forgive me. I hope that it was not completely incomprehensible. But what I wanted to, what, what, what Simone and I tried to do uh, with the, with using this approach is, is to suggest that the transition-oriented approach highlights both the, the, the novelties that characterize qualitatively new type of cognition and the evolutionary analysis of this uh, uh, of these transitions also points to the to their origins in in earlier systems so we can look at both the continuities and the discontinuities but what new systems what new levels have occurred but how this level occurred this was sometimes a very gradual system for example the transition from ual from the unlimited associative land to imaginative animals we believe was very 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 gradual the evolutionary transition uh, approach can also address all kinds of questions uh, that concern the, the primacy of different uh, activity. And for example, what came before, uh, there, there, was, there, is, uh, there are debates in psychological literature whether a Pavlovian uh, classical conditioning came, is more general or came before instrumental conditioning and so on. We can argue on the basis of our approach that they were entangled from the very beginning and they co-evolved, although to different degrees in different lineages. And the approach that we that uh, I presented here leads to realization for the need to study. It has all kinds of, it opens up fields of research. For example, we, we first of all realize that we need to study non-neural learning, epigenetic learning. We need to study learning in non-neural uh, in non-neural uh, organisms more generally, both uh, not, not only epigenetic learning at the cell level, but probably there are other types of learning that we don't fully understand. Although we're beginning to sort of uh, that there are beginnings of uh, uh, models that uh, uh, that try to figure them out. This approach also po uh, points to the need to study the two-tiered uh, memory system of neural organisms. Since all neural organisms have intracellular memory, epigenetic memory, and also synaptic intercellular memory, and, th and these two systems store information at different time spans, the question is how does this affect learning capacity? Is a two-tiered system better than just a neural system? Neural networks are based on a synaptic, uh, on a kind of Hebbian system. If we add another layer, what will it do? An intracellular layer. Uh, do transitions to sophisticated form of cognition, such as transition to UAL or to preparing organisms or to language, require new neural, dyna uh, neural dynamics? Uh, neural dynamics, uh, are Satmarie and uh, Fernando Crisanta suggests that there is a need for new uh, uh, neurodynamics in such systems. And uh, Simone and I also think that possibly this is necessary, although we, we, we differ in the kind of system that we suggest. But it is an open question, which I think has to be addressed. So I hope that, uh, so that's what I have to say here. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Eva. That was great. Um, so could I'll you stop sharing? Yeah, it's yeah? It, it's going to be easier if it's okay for you. Yeah, yeah, it's better for me because then I can see you. Yeah. yeah okay. Good. That was that was very good. Um, so some people had to leave and apologize in the in the chat. Uh, so that was a great presentation with a lot of things to discuss. So who wants to um, ask a question or make a, a comment maybe? Uh, I guess it's better if you use, so Scott, start, and then if you if that's okay for everyone, maybe using the, um, the raise your hand option in the reaction would be, would be the easiest way. Scott, please start. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eva. I'm going to have to go soon also, but I wanted to ask, and this is something that Tamar uh, probably is 
going to ask too. Uh, and that's the immune system as a cognitive network. Uh, is that parallel? Is that meshed together? I'm thinking of like operative learning in rats when they could become allergic when they smell something, you know, mount a humoral immune response uh, when they smell something, uh, which seems to not involve the brain, but to be a learning, uh, you know, a, a learning paradigm, but uh, using the immune system rather than the neural system. Yeah, uh, we think it is a cognitive system, definitely. The immune system is a cognitive system, according to our definition, because it learns. There is learning there, there is learning there. It has a lot of the capacities in this, uh, in this shopping list that uh, people are constructing. So we definitely say, think that the immune system is a cognitive system. It's a very, very interesting system. And it's very interesting also to, to try and see what it can do Versus, uh, because we were talking here about neural systems in, in, in this, uh, but now if you want to talk about, uh, uh, about cognitive systems, you can talk about the cell. The, there is epigenetic memory and epigenetic re learning in cells, in single cells. And there's definitely uh, there is definitely memory and learning in the immune system. So when you're talking about non neural systems. These are the systems to study. This, uh, the immune system is one of the most fascinating systems to study, and it would be enormously interesting to see how it works and compare it both to the cell, to the single cell, to the epigenetic system within the cell, and to the, and this is also a two-tiered system, although a very different one, because you have the memory both within each of the components, component cells, and within the system as a whole. So it's a fascinating system, but we didn't talk about it here. But it is definitely something that a theory of uh, learning, of, of, of learning, as, of cognition and learning has to focus on. Yeah. I'm wondering if you can even separate the nervous system from the immune system. Evolutionarily, probably you can't. Yeah, I think you're right. But uh, yes, because they are very, very intertwined. Well, but I think, you know, depends how you define also an immune, uh, it's not only the adaptive immune system we're talking about and, mm -hmm. the, and the sort of uh, uh, distinction between the adaptive and the non-adaptive are getting a little bit more fuzzy than they used to be in the, in the past <laughs> when I learned that in, the, in university. And a lot of, uh, and plants have an immune system too. And we can talk about immune systems at different levels. Thomas has wrote a lot about it. So, you know, it's, uh, I think that, but I think that we should not forget also the fact that once the nervous system evolves, it does give you some kind of extra. And we have to recognize this extra. It's not, yes, there is continuity. Yes, there are similarities. Yes, there are interactions and they are inter intertwined in evolution and in development. Mm -hmm. But there's also something that happened when the when neurons appeared in the world and nervous systems appeared in the world and, and brains appeared in the world and brains with lots of levels appeared in the world. And we have to understand these things too. So this is what I was focusing on. And, and, uh, and, and that, but you can focus on the other side of, the, of, of this very big coin too. And you will find fascinating things. But we think that looking at learning as, some, as a unifying thing is a very good way of approaching it. Thanks so much. Thank you. And thank you, Scott, for asking exactly the kind of questions I was about to ask, as you just said. Uh, that, that's, that's, that's perfect. I'm sure there are other questions. I, I have also one other question, another question, but I prefer to let everyone, uh, to give everyone the possibility to ask a question or make a comment, maybe. I'm not sure I see everyone, but I suppose that if you use the raise your hand option, I will see you on the screen. Or oh, Corinne will, maybe. Or oh, Jan Peter. That was a very old raise your hand option, uh, but I still haven't found a button. Anyway, uh, thank you very much for this uh, very stimulating talk. And I was just wondering, somewhat related to Scott's question, so if we are willing to apply the label cognition to, let's say, organisms, systems like the immune system and maybe organs, 
wouldn't it be necessary then to revise the, the shopping list of capacities a little bit? Because it seems that a lot of those capacities were actually designed or having in mind whole organisms. So could you speculate a little bit? And if we want to study systems and organs as cognitive systems, what would what capacities would we be uh, looking at? I mean, learning, obviously, but... Yes, I think, uh, you know, quite a lot of the capacities will be there. I mean, you know, and also it depends what level. If you think about orientation, for example, one of the things that they have there is orientation. Orientation of what? There are a fin they, if you think about the immune system, they move towards particular targets. So there is an orientation there. Yes, so we have to, I think that more than uh, than um, sort of change, maybe we shall have to change the, 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 the shopping list. But I think that mostly we shall have to qualify it. And I explain what exactly we mean by this, because movement towards an object in the outside world and movement of a cell towards another cell within the system is not exactly the same thing. So, and, they, and, they, and we have to qualify this kind of thing. But I think that most of these things will actually remain, most of them. But, I, but to be honest with you, I didn't try to do it with the immune system. So I can't give you a really good answer, a really informed answer to that, but it's, it's worth thinking about. Other questions? <laughs> So maybe while people maybe think about their questions or comments, uh, I have one question uh, about um, the unlimited associative learning and consciousness. So if I understood you correctly, Eva, you're saying that if we have the unlimited associative learning, we have all the char characteristics that have been traditionally associated with consciousness. So if I understand correctly, you leave open the possibility that there could be consciousness without uh, unlimited associative learning, but you're saying, I don't know this, and I don't know to find out about consciousness without this, right? Without, without trying to find a UAL in, in nature. Is, is that correct? Yes, uh, you're right. I mean, what we're claiming it, uh, is that you, for, there are two things, two aspects to your question, which are really, really important. The first is it's a positive marker. So if you have UAL, I can say, well, the chances are the creature is, is conscious. So if I find some, something like that on another planet and it has all these capacities, and I can reverse engineer from these capacities, to, uh, from, from the UAL to all these capacities, well, I will say, I will try not to hurt its feelings. Let, put me this. <laughs> Let me put it this way. I will be, okay? So that's one thing. And, but I will say, look, Creature that doesn't have UAL, I don't know. Now, the other aspect to ask is development. Obviously, a, a newborn child is conscious, but it doesn't have UAL yet. Why? Because UAL is a learning capacity. In order to learn, to, do, to discriminate between different objects, you have to put them into memory. You have to learn them. It's a process that takes a long time, right? So of course you will, but you already have through evolution, the capacity to unify, the capacity to evaluate, the capacity to do everything. And you use these capacities for anything that goes, that counts. Because we even evaluate and feel reflexes, the blink reflex, you feel it. It's a reflex, yes, it can occur without consciousness, but in conscious beings, it will occur with it because the system is already there and it is dominating in most cases, the whole organism. So UAL shows us, if we don't have UAL, I, you know, if I'm comparing animals and I don't know what to look at, I, and I don't know anything, and I'm looking only at behavior, this is what I have. Now, you can say, look, if I have UAL, and if I accept that this is a good marker, and if in order to have UAL, I have to have a certain brain organization, and certain dynamics of brain organization. Let's say that in order to have it, you have to have global ignition within the system or something like that. Some kind of internal marker of functionality, functional marker. If you have this, and if you prove that there is a strong, strong correlation between UAL and a certain type of brain or functional brain organization, 
or some kind of functional uh, of uh, dynamic feature of, of the nervous system, then you can look for that. And then you don't need UAL anymore, <laughs> but you needed it in order to get there. Yeah, okay, okay, very good. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, questions, comments? Please ask. Midal. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the nice talk. I have a kind of maybe a bit naive question, or maybe you covered that is also somehow contrasting the immune system with the learning of the neural uh, system is like that. What I understood is like you're talking about that from the parent to the offspring. So we have the, uh, the capacity which is uh, transferred, but not the learned information. On the other side, with the immune system, the learned uh, capacity of like how to attack the target can be also inherited. Do mm -hmm. you expect that this inform, is it just only this uh, kind of transition, I mean, transfer to the offspring, the, the capacity in the neural systems, or would you expect that there would be a way to go from the neural system learned information to the offspring, not with the behavior learning? I mean, like a kind of epigenetic learning yeah, or yeah. so. Yeah, well, there is some evidence for that. And you know, there are some, uh, there is evidence that things that uh, all kinds of uh, psychological trauma in mice, for example, uh, lead to changes in the expression of small RNA or to gene expression changes, which are associated with small RNAs. And this small RNA somehow get to the germline and they lead to, to, to behavioral changes, neurotic behavioral changes in the offspring. So, and this can be transmitted through the, and we know that it's transmitted through the germline because it is transmitted through males. So in males, you know, that you just take the, you just take the, the sperm, that's it. I see. So it's not through the mother and it's not through all the complexities of, uh, of uterine environment and all this kind of things, which involve a lot, a lot of routes of transmission. So yes, you have this kind of things, you know, it's one of the things that are very, very fascinating. And uh, it seems that this ancient uh, inheritance system, the epigenetic inheritance system, which is very, very ancient. I mean, it's, you know, really way, way back mm -hmm. is, uh, is operating in, uh, in this. But the interesting thing is, <laughs> that uh, in neural organisms with UAL especially, but in neural organisms that can learn by association, you have a new problem. And the problem is overlearning. You can very easily, you have a lot of false positives. So you are, uh, in, uh, you are under stress a lot. I mean, you can also, uh, there's good side to it, yeah. But, <laughs> Life is difficult, so a lot of it. So you're a lot uh, under a lot of stress, and if you're under a lot of stress, and you also transmit this stress to your offspring by the epigenetic system, you make them your uh, uh, also a little bit uh, uh, neurotic, and you don't want this. Well, maybe sometimes you do, but sometimes you don't. It, and it is an interesting question. When do you do? When do you want your offspring to be to be a little bit or a neurotic like you, and anticipate the problem? And when not? But certainly, too much neuro, uh, being too much being too neurotic is is not very good. And therefore, we think that maybe there was selection against transmission of epigenetic uh, in her uh, mark uh, epigenetic factors in this kind of animals that you will find less in the UAL animals than you will find in animals that learn by habituation and sensitization. It's an interesting question and we, but definitely there is transmission or epigenetic, uh, through epigenetic factors through the germline. There's no doubt about it. Although again, we, we, we are extremely ignorant about its extent, about its distribution, taxonomic distribution, this huge amount of uh, lacun lacunas of no in knowledge. Thank you, thank you very much. Yep, so I have a question also uh, regarding the, uh, the two-stage system of cognition and particularly uh, epigenetic memory. 
So uh, do you think, it's an open question, so do you think that there is potential to uh, underlie associative learning through this type of uh, uh, system or um, non-neuronal non uh, aspect of memory? Or do you need uh, ABN plasticity on top of that to, uh, according to you, what do you think? I think that for very simple associative learning, very limited, you probably don't need a neural system, but you can do it. Simona and I wrote a paper a long time ago in 2009, which was published, uh, called uh, Epigenetic Learning in Non-Neural Organisms. And we created little toy models of, uh, uh, of habituation, of sensitization, and even of very simple associative learning. But it, it has to be understood that it is very, very limited. Mm -hmm. It is limited because of functional constraints because yep. each of the proteins, if you don't have a kind of universal language that you can use for anything, that you can translate any kind of uh, stimulus into, this you don't have. Things are too specific and this is a huge constraint. So yes, you can to some extent, but it will be very, very limited. And what the nervous system gives you is, is this new language. Any kind of stimulus, any and motor, what a mechanical, not mechanical, sensory of any modality can be translated into the action potential. Okay. That's, you know, wow. It's like everything can be translated into mm -hmm. words. Not everything, of course, a lot. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, excuse me, can you hear me? Yes. yes, yes, go ahead if you have a question. Uh, thank you very much, Madam, for your presentation. Uh, actually, I prepared two uh, questions, but it depends on the time we have. Okay, the, the first question is, uh, uh, because you mentioned about the UAL, my, my first question is, uh, how the UAL avoids the uh, catastrophic uh, forgetting phenomenon? In this, in this uh, cognitive in this learning process, for example, a very specific problem is when the learning system, they, they, they have learned a new task, so they will forget his previously learned knowledge and change all the parameters to suit, to suit with the new task. And then if you change it with the old task, it is needed to learn again. So how could the UAL avoid the phenomenon of the catastrophic uh, forgetting? This is my first question. Uh, second question is, uh, how about uh, the scalability of a UAL? For example, you mentioned in your uh, presentation about the uh, flexible, for example, just the one a simple flex, uh, example is a flexible evaluation system. So you need to make a context-dependent learning uh, alter the values of a student from punishing and rewarding. So, uh, so madam, uh, when, when your tasks, when all the, environment, all the environment goes to the complicated, or your task go to the complex, how could you figure out the scalability uh, in the UAL? It's very good questions. Thank you very much. Now, what we think, you, you are right, it's a very, one of the things that we see is that there are levels. And for example, with, uh, with what, we, what you see with memory, when you're looking at stress memory, for example, uh, people, a lot of people have, uh, 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 have studied fear memory in rodents. And what you see is that there is a representation of it in the hippocampus, and then it moves somewhere else, right? So you free the hippocampus now to do something else and you move things. Now, so I think that one of the things, so this is one of the problems of the neurodynamics that I mentioned at the end. It's exactly that. And for example, Aristotle Murray is suggest, and uh, Fernando and Crisanto uh, Fernando are suggesting that there is a kind of actual Darwinian selection within the brain, Darwinian dynamics within the brain. A lot of variation, a lot of variations are created. And then among these variations, there is selection. And the variations that are selected are amplified all the time. There is amplification. This is one, the classical answer to your question is a, 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 an answer that does not require, a, a, that does not require amplification. 
but requires that there is a huge redundancy within the system. So that when you learn something, it's you learn, you, you sort of have many, 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 there are many, many, many networks that are more or less the same that are learning. And, and it's not just one thing, it's not just one little network that is learning. Yeah, there are many huge number of, it, it was first suggested in fact, you know, by Simon, by Richard Simon in 1904, in, in his classic uh, uh, book, The, the Mnim, that there is, that anything that we learn, we learn at the same time in many, many, uh, with many, 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 many copies. And then there is kind of selection among the scopes. Now, you can also think about it uh, the way that Edelman, for example, and Changer thought about it. When they were thinking about neural selection, they were thinking about a brain that is very rich in connections, in synaptic connections, and a huge networks with a lot, a lot of redundancy within them. And then you sort of, you, you uh, inhibit some connections and you reinforce some connections and you change it like you're changing a picture, right? So there are all kinds of suggestions uh, about it. And it is possible, we are, we like me and Simona, we sort of suggested it, but very carefully and we, it's completely speculative, totally speculative. We like, we, we were very impressed by the fact that you have these levels that memory seems to sort of migrate from one level to another. And we were wondering how does it migrate? And maybe it migrates through small RNAs, ves through vesicles within the brain. Yes, into, into higher level, into, into other levels. I don't know, but it's very important. The question you are asking is really about the neurodynamics of this, uh, of this complex system. And we don't really have very good, we have all kinds of tentative models and, uh, and uh, but I don't think that there is anything at the moment that I can say, well, this is the answer to a question, but it is the kind of approach that we are suggesting is definitely, definitely opening up this question. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madame. Very nice exchange. Uh, any any other question? We still have five minutes. If um, you have questions or comments. Well, if everything is clear, what shall we do? Well, I mean, I agree with you. I agree with you. <laughs> There was well, so I'll if, you, if, you, if we have five minutes, I'll tell you that Simona and I and the picture that you saw of Anna are now produced. I'm not saying this as uh, it will be published only, I don't know, uh, next spring, hopefully. But we're going to publish a picture book, Art and Science about Consciousness, which encompasses many of the things that, were, with, that we talked about here, not all of them, but many, many others that were not talked here, including humans and fantasies and things like that. I'm just telling you in the last five minutes that we're going, that we had uh, that uh, we stay stayed safe with the uh, sane with the corona by uh, doing this kind of project. We decided <laughs> that people need to know about evolution of consciousness. It's very very important for their lives. So <laughs> that's great. That's great. What what better way to yeah to to use this difficult time of the lockdown yeah, and, uh, yeah. and all the rest. Yeah. Um, okay, that's 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 great. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Really, I'm uh, very grateful for your patience, and thank you very much for the intelligent questions. And uh, that's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. Thank you, Simona, as well. Um, this was uh, great to interact with you. Thank you again for accepting the invitation, and we look forward to maybe seeing you another time in Bordeaux in real life, if it's, uh, if it's doable. That would well, be... if there is real life anymore. I'm, I'm, I'm very optimistic, so I tend to think so, but we'll see, we'll yeah. see. Thank you very <laughs> Thank much. You. It will Thank be you pleasure. so much and take Thank care. You. Bye. Bye.